Good day, my name is Andy van der Dobbelsteen. At TU Delft, I am Professor of Climate Design and Sustainability, teaching students how to design energy neutral, climate adaptive, circular, nature inclusive buildings and cities. Today, I will introduce you to heat demand in the built environment. The goal of today's lecture is to describe the differences between energy and power, to give you some examples of power with real world examples, and to explain some ways we can prepare for a warmer climate. Before I do that, I want to suggest you to watch the short film called Energy Slaves. It was made for another MOOC, Zero Energy Design, explaining in a funny and dramatic way how, energy, how much energy a common Dutch household uses. The film can be found on YouTube. But for now, let's go to some basic theory about energy. The unit for energy is Joule. Other magnitudes of energy are expressed by kilojoule, megajoule, gigajoule, terajoule, petajoule and exajoule, the largest order of magnitude on planet Earth. When looking at buildings, megajoules and gigajoules are the mo units most used. Other units used for energy are calorie or kilocalorie. The latter is what you usually see on the wraps of food. An energy unit commonly used for electricity is watt hour, kilowatt hour or gigawatt hour. Kilowatt hour is the common unit for electricity use in buildings. Now let's look at the unit of power. Power is the energy used or produced over a certain period. So its logical unit is joule per second, for which we use the term watt. And just as with energy, power can be given different magnitudes. Kilowatt, megawatt, gigawatt, terawatt, petawatt. For buildings, kilowatt and megawatt are the most common units. A different unit for power is the one Mr. James Watt originally started with, horsepower. One horsepower equals 746 Watt, but a horse is actually stronger than that. Important to remember from this slide is that one kilowatt hour equals 3.6 megajoule or in reverse, one megajoule equals 0.278 kilowatt hours. You will need this later when we do energy conversions. Here you see a table with typical values for power of human activities. We all use energy, even when asleep. Just sitting behind your screen, you already use over a little over 100 watts. As you can see, judo is physically and energetically one of the most powerful sports, 10 times more powerful than sitting. Not all of this power, however, is put into force and motion. Most of the 1150 watts is emitted as heat. On the right hand side, you see the power of some forms of equipment. Through LEDs, lighting has become up to 95% more efficient compared to old fashioned light bulbs. Mind that a big car requires enormous power. About 100 horses, that's quite a carriage. And again, a lot of heat produ is produced when exerting this power. Now let's have a look at fossil fuels. If you look well at the energy value of natural gas, petrol, diesel, kerosene or vegetable oils and fats, you might see a common denominator. They are all revolving around 36 megajoules, or 10 kilowatt hours as we know from the conversion factor. LPG, liquefied petrol gas and coal are of a minor energy god. They only contain about 25 megajoules of energy. And wood, not a fossil fuel though, contains 20 megajoules per kilogram. To get an even better feeling for energy, I will now tell you a story of the flame, which Professor Jo Hermans once taught me. The power of one flame, either from a candle, from wood or from gas, is always around 100 watts. If a flame burns for one hour, it will have produced 100 watts times one hour, which is 100 watt hours, 0.1 kilowatt hours, or 0.36 megajoules. That does not sound like a lot, does it? Well, let's see why showering takes so much energy. Therefore, we need to know the power of a boiler. Old boilers or geysers often had 10 times 10 flames heating a pipe of water. This means the power of such a power of such a boiler or geyser is 10 times 10 times 100 watts, which is 10,000 watts or 10 kilowatts. That's quite a lot. Knowing all the basics, we can simply calculate the amount of energy required for showering. So, how much does showering cost? 
It won't apply to most people, but the ones really addicted to showering, who spend an hour on their warm water, will use the power of the boiler for one hour, costing 10 kilowatt hours, or one liter of diesel. Think of taking a milk carton filled with diesel to the shower. A somewhat more modest shower, spending 20 minutes, uses 3.3 kilowatt hours. You could say a beer bottle from a Belgian Abbey with filled with diesel. If you are invent environmentally conscious or a fast shower, you will need a double whiskey size of diesel. And that saves a lot of fuel compared to 20 minutes of showering or more. Now this was all for basic understanding. Let's return to our topic, the building. According to recent figures, how much energy does a Dutch household use? For their home, Dutch households on average need 1200 cubic meters of gas for heating, hot water and cooking. This is 11.8 megawatt hours of thermal energy. For electricity, 2500 kilowatt hours of electricity is needed, 2.5 megawatt hours. But we should actually account for more. Why is that? Electricity is generated in power plants, which usually burn fossil fuels for heat that drives a generator which in turn produces electricity. Not all energy content of the fuel is converted to electricity. Most is actually waste heat. So the kilowatt hours of electricity you receive has cost more kilowatt hours of fuel, which we call the primary energy. In the Netherlands, the average efficiency of power plants is 50%. So the 2.5 megawatt hours has actually cost five megawatt hours of primary energy. Together, the total amount of primary energy needed for the house is 16.8 megawatt hours, or close to 7.6 megawatt hours per person. As you can see, even with the inefficiency of power plants, the greatest use of energy is due to the heat demand for domestic heating and hot water, even if we account for heat generated by irradiation of the sun and by people and equipment. This of course applies to the Netherlands and other countries in relatively cold climates. In warm climates, the demand for cold is dominant. And since cold is commonly provided by cooling equipment, such as air conditioners, this form of energy is generated by electricity. Don't forget, however, that cooling means generating waste energy, heat. So mechanically cooling a building means producing heat. I will demonstrate why this is an important notion. Firstly, it's good to understand that the demand for heat, domestic heating in particular, depends on the urban design, building typology, energy technology applied, and user behavior. Here you see a map of Amsterdam, with its energy labels on the left and the use of natural gas on the right. You can distinguish the area that uses most energy for heating, the historic inner city. In the Netherlands, in the year 2019, the temperature record of 1944 was broken by more than two degrees. For the first time in history, more than 40 degrees Celsius was measured in this country with a temperate climate. What we tend to forget is that meteorological measurements take place outside cities and that cities are actually warmer than the rural countryside, up to 10 degrees extra. So the record temperature of 40.7 degrees at the military airport of Kilsreye must have been close to 48 in the nearby city of Tilburg. This is due to the urban heat island effect a natural phenomenon. The dominant factor in the urban heat islands is, absor is absorbed solar radiation, but also waste heat from human processes and equipment is a factor. And northern cities have, have not been designed for extreme summer temperatures, compensating very little of undesired heat. Knowing that cities become warmer due to climate change, we can think of a few measures to take. The first is to use bioclimatic design to optimally use the local circumstances. For buildings in temperate climates, mechanical cooling might not be necessary when using the low mean temperature of the soil, for instance. When temperatures are shifting, regions that used to be cooler can learn from the traditional architecture of warmer regions. In old times, people needed to create comfortable buildings without too much technology, so they had to be smart and now we can learn from these designs and apply their principles in colder regions. Cities can also be cooled by converting solar radiation, which otherwise would become heat, into electricity and hot water. 
For many in the regions in the world that require heating in winter and cooling in summer, heat pumps seem to be a logical solution. They can both heat and cool. As well as air conditioners, air-to-air -air heat pumps release heat into in the, in the cooling mode, so they contribute to the urban heat island effect. So we should be mindful to use technology only that does not disturb the urban climate. Finally, and certainly not least, greenery can be a very effective means to reduce undesired heat in cities. Plants provide shading, retain rainwater, and cool the air by evapotranspiration. Natural air conditioners they are. These measures prepare buildings for a changing warmer climate. Next to that, the design or redesign of buildings can be done in a zero energy, zero carbon manner when applying the method presented next to me. Research, reduce, reuse, produce. Next time, I will explain how these steps can contribute to decarbonizing heat in the built environment. See you then.